What's up everybody? Welcome to the Werewolf Bar and Whiskey with a Werewolf Hunter. I'm your host, Brian P. Easton, author of the Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter series. Now when we're talking about whiskey, which we do here at the Werewolf Bar, there are certain traditions among aficionados and the casual drinker alike. Uh, and these traditions can be as simple as sniff the whiskey before you drink it, uh, sip it, don't slam it. Uh, but one of the big ones is that you don't drink a single malt whiskey with ice. Right? You drink it neat. Now, nowadays, even master distillers are saying uh, it's okay if you have a, uh, an ice cube with your single malt. That uh, ice cools it down and then melts it down and then the, the, the water from the ice brings out the flavor. Uh, of the single malt, but for a very long time, and even even into today, uh, there is this tradition that you don't that you don't use ice, and it was considered to be the mark of a philistine if you did. Now, sometimes the purist would add a a teaspoon of water to the spirit to kind of bring out more of its subtle notes, which is the whole reason why the, the some master distillers are saying it's okay to let the ice. Uh, a, a cube of ice melt in your in your glass and it serves the same purpose. Um, but they'll add a teaspoon of water to it or so, especially if it's a cask strength, kind of lessens the the heat of the drink and lets you taste some of the, the richer notes of it. Uh, but uh, traditionally, those who like to drink their single malt a little chilled will use something called whiskey stones. And like these... Now, these are something that I got for Christmas for my sister-in-law. They're just a little uh, round stones. These are cut from stones in the Great Lakes, rounded and smooth and polished. And they come in a little holder here. And uh, the cooler you want your whiskey to be, the more stones you would add. Okay. And the idea behind this is uh, that you put these stones in the freezer and when you're ready for your whiskey, you just drop them in, and uh, it cools the whiskey down without adding without adding ice. Now, whiskey stones don't have to be actual stones. Okay, all you really need uh, is for whatever you're using there to be uh, to be able to hold a chill for one thing, and then to, you know to be able to be cleaned fairly readily. Uh, so when I came across these. I knew I had to have them for the werewolf bar. Okay, silver whiskey bullets. Well, stainless steel anyway. And uh, these guys have been in the freezer for uh, a couple of days awaiting our creature of the night, which is uh, an unusual creature here at the werewolf bar. This is a uh, Irish single malt. That's 100% malted barley. Uh, that's distilled in copper pots, and it's called the Sexton. Okay, the bottle has kind of got this black glass, uh, gothic hexagon-shaped thing going on. There's a skeleton with, wearing a top hat on the label and on the top of the cork. There. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so let's give this a try. Let's kill this creature uh, with some, uh, some silver bullets. Just add a little there. And like I said, you just add as many of your whiskey stones, or in this case, your whiskey silver bullets, uh, as you'd like to, to keep it, uh, make it cold. So I'll add two or three of them here. Yeah. So the Sexton single malt Irish whiskey. Uh, with some uh, whiskey bullets to your health. Now it's not bad. It's a little sweeter than I expected. But you can sure taste the sherry from the cask it was distilled in. It's got a long finish to it too. Pretty smooth. Let me read you something. Let me read you something from the label here because I think it sounds pretty cool. So on the label it says, uh, show up before dawn and you'll catch on the cool morning breeze the unmistakable oak 
from breathing casks. Once filled with Spanish sherry, now brimming with aqua vitae. Stila drop, savor the notes of rich dried fruit and complexity. Driven by years in deep oak encased slumber, you see to be the sexton is a spiritual trade and whiskey is his favorite spirit. So for those of you who don't, not familiar with what a sexton is, it's a trade that looks after uh, church cemeteries and such. And at one time, uh, it was basically a professional grave digger. So anyway, that's enough about that. So in the earliest episodes of Whiskey with a Werewolf Hunter, we talked a lot about monster hunting and monster hunters and the different influences out there that had uh, weighed in on the formation of the character of Sylvester Logan James. Now, monster hunting has roots in the mythology of just about every culture under the sun and upon those whom the sun has already set. So last week I was brushing up on a little bit of the, of the ancient Greek myths and uh, the Greek heroes uh, of the of those myths, the, the monster slayers, especially, uh, Perseus, Theseus, Jason, and they came across uh, one of the more neglected legends of antiquity, uh, one of the greatest, in fact, pre-Hercules characters, uh, monster slayers, uh, by the name of Cadmus. Uh, now, Cadmus was apparently a Phoenician prince, the founder of Thebes, and a renowned slayer of dragons. Now, this specific story that I'm about to refer to uh, doesn't just involve a monster. It involves basically the father of monsters, uh, Typhon or Typhus. Uh, Typhon was just about the most terrible force of chaos ever. I mean, when Olympus tried to stop him, uh, they failed. And he went on to tear out uh, the sinews of Zeus himself and... Uh, you know, make him immobile. Couldn't kill him. You know, Zeus is immortal, so he couldn't couldn't take his life. Uh, but he sure uh, gave him a country ass whipping. So in this version of the myth uh, that I was reading, uh, Pan and Apollo uh, go find Cadmus because they've hatched a plan uh, to get uh, revenge on on Typhon. And so they find, they find Cadmus, and they share their plans with him, and Cadmus disguises himself as a shepherd, uh, specifically a shepherd uh, minstrel, I guess, because he's, uh, the pan, he knows how to play, and Pan actually gives him his pipes uh, on which to play. And so he goes, Cadmus disguises as a shepherd with the pipes of Pan, goes, he finds Typhon, and he plays this music for him. Now, Typhon has never heard music before, and so he was understandably uh, entranced by the sound of this, this strange music or the, the, this strange new sound that he was hearing. And uh, Cadmus told him, oh, that's nothing. Uh, this is nothing compared to the, the music that I can make on, my, on a lyre. Uh, but unfortunately, the sinews on my lyre are broken. And so you know, we're out of luck. Well, the, so as, you know, as was intended... Uh, by the plan, Typhon says how much more wonderful his lyre would sound if it were strung with the sinews of Zeus, which he happened to have. So he, he gives Cadmus uh, the sinews of Zeus. Uh, uh, Cadmus says, I've got to go back to my shepherd's hut to restring this. Takes off with the sinews. Uh, is re Zeus is restored and comes back, surprises Typhon, who's you know already licking his wounds from the previous battle. Uh, he did not go unscathed in that. But Zeus is able to overpower him and bury him under uh, Mount Etna. And such is where Typhon supposedly sleeps to this day. Now the point of the story for me uh, was that uh, hunting monsters takes guile as well as guts. That's yeah, something that we don't always think about. Uh, talking about monster hunting uh, tonight, uh, we have on the program a guest I've wanted to have with us uh, since we started the show. Uh, his name is Miles Booth, and he was responsible for the Legends of the Monster Hunter Anthology series a few years back uh, that I talked about in some of our early episodes. 
Uh, if you were to watch some of those from uh, early in 2019, you're bound to hear me talk about them because I went over them, well, went over them all pretty thoroughly. Uh, Miles founded MB Press as an indie house dedicated to the subgenre of monster hunting. And he has fought the good fight in the trenches of Amazon warfare and indie press shakeups and the demands on his own time from forces uh, beyond the pale and beyond the written word. So he's here tonight to tell us a little bit about the history of MB Press and present with us, uh, or present to us why he thinks uh, my autobiography of a werewolf hunter series uh, should be committed to film. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome to Whiskey with the Werewolf Hunter, editor, publisher, visionary, fellow monster hunter, and my friend, Miles Booth. I discovered Brian's books around 10 years ago, I think. And I had only made it halfway through autobiography when I realized I was completely loving the idea that he was writing about, uh, the monsters, the monster hunter. And I also realized what a complete lack there was of that in the marketplace. And I just wanted there to be more. I had been writing a bit for uh, Pill Hill Press at the time, and I pitched them the idea of a Monster Hunter anthology. And they were kind enough to, to accept that idea, and I started putting the idea together, and we put together a call for submissions for the stories that would appear in that book. And in the description for the call for submissions, I included that I was inspired by Brian Easton's book, Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter. I think that <clears throat> Pill Hill Press somehow got in touch with Permuted Press, who was the publisher of that version of Brian's book at the time. And uh, somehow this made it to Brian. And within a fairly short amount of time, as the book was nearing completion as far as the stories being chosen and the editing was, was beginning, uh, I, was, I received a note from my publisher saying that Brian would be happy to be involved in this. And uh, indeed, he wound up doing the foreword for the first book, Leather, Denim, and Silver, uh, and also contributed to the Trigger Reflex. And Pill Hill Press closed shortly after that. Uh, and we were in the middle of making a third book, which would become Use Enough Gun. And that's how MB Press was created. Uh, originally inspired by sitting on my couch one afternoon reading Brian's book. This is Miles Booth with MB Press at the forthcoming MB Press Radio. And Brian was kind enough to invite me to contribute something to Whiskey with a Werewolf Hunter. Uh, so what I thought I would do is make my pitch for why his books absolutely need to be translated onto film. Could be uh, a feature film, could be long form TV, but I'm gonna really focus on feature films tonight because long form TV hasn't exactly existed for, for too long. Uh, and we can do a lot of, of comparison by looking at the history of, of werewolves on film. And uh, he didn't stipulate what I should talk about, so I got to pick, and, and this is it. So this is my pitch for why Brian Easton's autobiography of a werewolf hunter series absolutely has to be translated to film. A um, couple of qualifications before we begin. The first is that werewolves have to be the primary focus of the film. So often they are in a film, but they're part of an ensemble or they are a background image. And we're talking about movies where werewolves are front and center. That's what the movie's about. Um, we're also 
talking about movies where Hollywood has given them a proper push. So there's a lot of indie flicks. There's a lot of, uh, well, I don't know, exploitation-oriented stuff. They, werewolves make all the rounds. Uh, but not that many actually get the Hollywood push. And that's that's really what what I'm focusing on uh, to... And then we're going to be keeping an eye on the successful werewolf films, the films that people do like, and their literary ties. So one more check in the box for why Brian's books need to be uh, part, of, part of film history and, and bring werewolves to life on film. So we go all the way back to the film that started it all, 1941, The Wolfman, on Cheney. Uh, and the screenwriter, Kurt, uh, Cedemac, who, I don't know what his influences were, but he obviously felt strongly about portraying, uh, the folklore image, uh, of a werewolf. And it was a big hit at the time. Hollywood pushed it. It was part of the universal monsters that were becoming popular at the time. And it, it really defined the werewolf genre in film, and it's never been replaced. It just still is the, the gold standard. So um, after that, we went through a very long period of time <laughs> where there were a lot of werewolf films made, uh, but none that really stood out as far as Hollywood goes. And um, I'm not talking about international. I'm not talking about independent movies. I'm talking about big movies that captured America's imagination. And, um, you know, that didn't happen again for about 40 years. Uh, so 1941 was The Wolfman. Ironically, and this had to have been on some people's minds, 1981 was really the, the comeback. That was the year of the werewolf. And what we saw that year was movies released uh, in the spring, uh, in the summer, and then in the early fall. And uh, three of the biggest movies in werewolf cinema. So The Howling, uh, based on Gary Brandner's novel. And that's a literary tie right there, based on a novel. Uh, and that, that blew, blew minds. That was amazing at the time the special effects blew people's doors off and it is still one of the defining werewolf movies uh after that came wolfen based on a whitley streeper novel and <clears throat> that was noted of course for using thermography uh the first use of that um but also it was it was very creative in its werewolf lore it really brought something new to the genre. It was captivating uh, for more than just a, a detective drama in, in New York City. Um, after that, of course, was an American werewolf in London. And John Landis did not base that on the novel. He came up with that idea himself and curated it over, I guess, about a decade before he really had everything together to make it. He he clearly was heart and soul into it. Uh, and really, again, pushed the envelope uh, as far as special effects, as far as story, characterization. He, he made an amazing and probably the uh, most well-regarded werewolf film of, of the time. Um, and then we went through another drought. Now, keep in mind, if you, if you look back at werewolf movies, there's a ton of them. They're, they're all over the place. It's just that they're not good movies or well-known movies. Um, and so, you know, we went through a period of years. Uh, the 80s were eh, not so great. A lot of, again, exploitation-oriented stuff. Uh, not real exploitation, but certainly exploitation of the werewolf myth. And... Uh, what, 90, 86, I guess, was Silver Bullet. Uh, and the only reason I mention that one is because of Stephen King. It's a literary tie. But that was really more about the main character of Marty than it was werewolves. It added 
next to nothing to werewolf lore. It didn't advance werewolves. It didn't make anything new happen for them. Um, it just kind of was there for, for Hollywood to, to, to bank in and keep, keep that image alive. Uh, and then we sat dormant for a while as far as, as good stuff goes. There are a few notable things here and there, uh, but from 86 all the way to uh, 94, I think, was uh, Wolf. And Wolf was a werewolf movie, is true, but Wolf was really a Jack Nicholson movie, and a Michelle Pfeiffer movie. It was not about werewolves. Um, it's not a bad movie. You know, people enjoyed it. It was not a box office uh, hit. It wasn't a bomb. It kind of settled there in the middle. Uh, stylish for the early 90s, I guess. Uh, but most notably to me about that one was uh, Jim Harrison was scripting that movie and uh, left due to differences, creative differences. And uh, Jim Harrison, of course, probably most well known for uh, Legends of the Fall as far as film goes. Um, clearly, any writing uh, fans know him from his many works, uh, many written works. But he left, and one of the things that, that he said about the movie at the time was that they took his wolf that he was writing about and turned it into a chihuahua. So again, it was Hollywood going down the wrong road, turning uh, a werewolf movie into a star vehicle, and, you know, that, that always turns out the same. So, not great. Um, <clears throat> then we go through another drought, and not a whole lot uh, of great stuff happening. Not a big push from Hollywood. Some decent films here and there. You know, Neil Marshall did come out with Dog Soldiers, which was um, a cool werewolf movie, but clearly not a big werewolf movie. And um, so there's a few others scattered here and there. Some fan favorites. It's definitely some, some movies that I enjoyed, but they are numerous uh, and, and not, not what I would consider to be uh, material for this particular conversation. So we get all the way up to uh, 2010, and the 2000s were really uh, just the ensemble decade. That's where every movie franchise had some werewolves in it, uh, but none of them focused on the werewolves, so uh, Underworld. Not a huge focus on werewolves. Um, Harry Potter, Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Van Helsing. Wow, I mean, it, it is a bunch of them. And they all got better in special effects. There's some, some very cool visuals there. And uh, they didn't really get too much into what makes a werewolf a werewolf. So we look back and... Uh, what we what we see is the successful werewolf movies showed what people want to see, which is the wolf. They want the savagery. They want the the part of the the werewolf that is terrifying to us. They want the thing, and uh, there was this idea to bring that back in 2010 with the remake of of the original, and it was the Wolf Man. Um, and now just one word, the Wolfman, uh, Benicio Del Toro, Anthony Hopkins. And <clears throat> I like that movie. I do. I like it a lot. Uh, but it was not a big hit. Uh, audiences didn't get it. It was atmospheric. It was filmed beautifully. But it didn't bring the story. It didn't bring the magic. Um... And then things kind of just drifted all apart from there. So, again, we have a lot of ensemble stuff since then. And uh, there's a lot of werewolf material in development. Some novels that are being developed right now in the scripts. Uh, but nothing that really blows your doors off. So, we're going to take a moment and uh, because it's whiskey with a werewolf hunter, and we do want to stay in the spirit of things, uh, tonight's whiskey 
is a local uh, distillery for me. This is uh, ASW, and this is uh, Fiddler. So it's it's a nice bourbon, um, easy drinking. I have a sweet tooth when it comes to bourbon. So cheers to Brian. Cheers to everyone watching. It is just delicious. Um, <clears throat> we get to the part where Brian's books fit into all of this. Um, Brian, as everyone is watching this, has already read, did more than create a werewolf story. Brian created uh, a werewolf lineage, which was the title of the third book in the series. He created characters that existed on both sides of what people really crave to see in their werewolves. The werewolves are truly embodiments of evil and the people surrounding them are not that far off in, in many ways, but also maintain their humanity and then constantly show us the dichotomy of, of staying human while you're battling the beast. Uh, Brian's gone into great details with this, um, better than I could ever do, of course, but it's, it's all there and it's all absolutely perfect for film. And <clears throat> as we look at the, the original trilogy and then the new, uh, the new series, the Michael Winterfox journals, there's so much material and there's so much detail and what he did with the lineage, not just the book, but the actual lineage of the werewolves, all of the different characters, rich in detail, uh, all of the different hierarchy, all of the different ways that they regard humanity and humanity regards them. And he does it in such a way that's completely modern and it's another point that I bring up as far as what works in today's world and what works on film. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up Universal's current complete failure to produce anything good related to the Universal monsters, a property they've been trying to revive for a very long time, and they just fail. Uh, sorry, Universal. Um, your history is, is not to be touched. It is what it is. And you've never risen to the occasion since then. And, uh, you know, when we look at what people want, what they need, they need a modern approach to this. They need an evolution. So we see what Universal currently has on on the slate for the dark universe and they keep throwing something out there and pulling it back and uh dracula untold i think that that was it that didn't work um not a bad movie fun to watch not big tent universe material uh obviously the mummy with tom cruise a very serious push towards creating a new monster universe and uh there was a lot to like in that movie but again you can't get a Hollywood committee with 68 different players and no vision together and think that something's going to work. That works great for, you know, adventure films, cop films, things that we're all used to, simple genre stuff, not monster films. You can't do it. You've got to have that literary root. You've got to have that person that the entire movie is focused around that, that brings the magic in that understanding of what humanity wants to see in their monsters. So when I say Brian's movie or Brian's books have to be made into movies, uh, I don't mean just, I would like to see them as all of you would too. I mean, the universe that he's created, we talk about a dark universe reboot. What if universal came to Brian who acknowledged the history of Universal, I mean, his first book was originally uh, titled When the Autumn Moon is Bright, <laughs> before uh, Permuted, Permuted Press came out with uh, Autobiography of a Werewolf Hunter. So uh, he's acknowledged it. He's very familiar with it. There are 
uh, homages, and it's 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 all there. Perfect person for this job. And what if what if what they need now is not just a monster, but a monster, a hunter, and a look at humanity through the eyes of a werewolf story that is perfectly set for today. So I, I think that uh, his movies are absolutely, or again, his books, I keep speaking about his movies. I, I hope that they will be. I think that his books are, are set to really just pick the torch up and carry it forward. We don't need a decade lapse in, in werewolf movies anymore because we get a vampire movie uh, all the time. I mean, we get all sorts of movies uh, every year. Um, and this whole pause, wait, pause, wait thing with the werewolf movies, that's, that's, not, that's not necessary. They just need a good property to work from. And it can't be a standalone novel. They need a universe. And there's one here. It's, it's the best one that's currently uh, out there. And it's the best one that's been out there for quite some time. So that's my pitch. Um, again, cheers to all the, the werewolf and whiskey, uh, aficionados out there. And, uh, I, I do genuinely hope that, uh, maybe in some way my pitch to, to make Brian's books into movies is, is somehow effective. Cheers. Thank you, Miles. That was a great pitch, and I have to tell you, I, for one, am sold. I've been fortunate enough in my life to have received a few compliments. But I tell you, when a guy starts an indie press and all that that entails, inspired by something I wrote, well, I just feel more honored than I can succinctly put into words. So, one more for the road. And that'll about do it for us this evening. Thanks for stopping by the Werewolf Bar, and be sure to watch next time. Dr. T. Broussard will be back with us. Until then, happy hunting, and mind the moon.